Welcome everyone to the spring 2020 meeting of the Human Services Advocacy Network. My name is William Tarter Jr. and I am the Associate of Public Policy and External Affairs for the Center for Community Solutions. We're a nonpartisan public policy think tank located in downtown Cleveland. I'm thrilled to welcome you to a very special uh, HSAN where we welcome two very special guests, State Representative Jeff Crossman and State Representative Terrence Upchurch. Representative, District, uh, Representative Jeffrey Crossman uh, represents the 15th House District, which represents Parma, Brooklyn Heights, Cuyahoga Heights, and parts of Southwest Cleveland. Jeff Crossman began his first term serving the Ohio House in January 2019. Jeff is a dedicated public servant and brings his five years of experience as a Parma City Councilman to the State House. Jeff earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Mount Union and a master's degree from the University of Akron. He's a practicing attorney and earned his law degree from Cleveland Marshall College of Law after graduating magna cum laude. Representing the 10th House District, State Representative Terrence Upchurch recently served as a special assistant to Cleveland City Council and previously worked alongside Cuyahoga County Councilman Anthony Harrison. From his time working in city council, Terrence has learned and developed a keen understanding of the nuances of government, which he brings to the state house. He earned his bachelor's degree in political science from Cleveland State University and is pursuing a master's of public administration degree from Villanova University. Our conversation this morning will be moderated by the president and executive director of the Center for Community Solutions, Mr. John Corlett. John? Thank you, Will, and thank you everybody for joining us this, this morning, particularly Representative Upchurch and Representative Crossman. We're really happy to have both of you here. Uh, and I think you know, both of you come out of uh, uh, service at the local level and local government, and we're seeing you know, what a vital role local government and state government is playing in the midst of this uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic and emergency that we're facing. So we appreciate you joining us this morning. We know you're really busy. And thanks to everybody for helping us with uh, taking, uh, figuring out the format this morning. This is the first time of doing this, so we appreciate everyone's patience. And I also appreciate you know, all of you who have joined us this morning for this conversation, particularly those of you who are working in direct service agencies. We know how important and critical your time is right now and how important and critical the services you are providing are. So what I'm going to do is ask a few questions. It's really some sort of general questions, and then we'll take questions through the uh, chat box. You'll be able to type questions in there, and uh, Danny will help me. Uh, Danny Carlson, our Director of Communications and Digital Strategy, will help me sort of uh, serve up those questions. We have to, until about 10.30, uh, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I'll, I'll start with really kind of a basic question, um, and it's uh, for both Representative Upchurch and Representative Crossman. Uh, and maybe we'll start first with Representative Upchurch on this first question. And it, the question is, how do you think the state of Ohio is doing right now in our response to the coronavirus? You know, it, it's gotten a lot of attention nationally uh, and uh, in the state in terms of kind of, it seems like we're kind of at the forefront and being very aggressive in our response. But I wonder if there's any place we, where you're hearing that we need to do more, any concerns you have, or anything that you want to sort of lift up as being particularly positive. So thank you very much, and uh, that's the first question. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I want to uh, thank you all for having me today. Um, happy to be here. I think this is a, a healthy conversation, and it's much needed. Uh, as far as Ohio's response to the coronavirus, I think that uh, we have done a decent job of being uh, proactive and not reactive. Uh, you know, I think the governor is earnest in his in his intentions and his concern for the public health. Uh, I understand the necessity to uh, shut down some things and uh, put a halt to normal life because the public health is, is, is the greatest concern. Um, some of my concerns, and I, I think uh, my colleague, Rep. Crossman, uh, probably shares the same feelings or what, what will be the uh, economic impact when this is all said and done. Uh, because if you shut down certain businesses for, you know, three or four weeks, it's going to have a, a major impact, especially um, on uh, low-wage workers. Um, you know, I'm just concerned about uh, the impact that, you know, working Ohio families uh, will have on this uh, in lieu of, of this crisis, because I, I think we're on the verge of this bankrupting more people than potentially uh, killing people. 
Um, so that's one of my biggest concerns. But I think overall the response has, has been has been pretty solid. I mean, we've been proactive, uh, and I know our caucus has been working tirelessly to come up with a, a package as it pertains to economic relief uh, in the form of legislation that can um, startle any economic damage that um, this crisis may have. So with that, I, I'll turn it over to my colleague. I, I'm happy to answer the same question. Thank you, Representative Upchurch. In fact, he, uh, Representative Upchurch and I were having this conversation this morning uh, before the, the, the conference call started. Uh, you know, I share his concern about the economic uh, impact this is going to have because, and I think this ties into our discussion today, uh, you know, poverty is going to cause uh, as many uh, uh, issues as this coronavirus epidemic is causing currently. So, you know, we have to be mindful as state policymakers, um, you know, and I, and I, I, I applaud the governor for his uh, approach and listening to professionals and experts on this health crisis and, and this public health issue. Um, but we have to also be mindful of the economic impact this is going to have, which is why, at least on the Democratic side of the aisle, we have been working together. We have been in constant contact. We've been having telephone conversations uh, to come up with a package of legislation that we think uh, should be prioritized uh, as we return to session next week. Um, the governor has done a nice job. I think our, our director of health has done a nice job. Um, I think we could have uh, we've stumbled a little bit on things like the election. I think we probably could have handled that uh, a little better. Um, schools, I think we could have handled that a little bit better. Um, there's still some things to resolve there, um, but I think on the whole we've done a pretty good job. If you compare our, um, you know our rates of infection relative to other states uh, and certainly around the world, uh, it seems to be having a positive. These actions seem to be having a positive impact. That said, we have to start planning for when what it looks like when we can start easing restrictions and returning um, our state back to its um, uh, economic health. Um, so there's some things to work out. We're, we we in, uh, are going back to the legislature next week uh, to take action. I'm not exactly sure how long we'll be there, but um, there's a lot of important work to get done here yet. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate that. and. Uh... Um, I, I want to tell people um, that uh, yeah we are we do have every, all of our participants other participants on mute the folks who have called in so I just want to let people know that I know we had a question about that so um, so I, I want to ask another question maybe a little bit more about this and and you I think Representative Upchurch you kind of hinted at this a little bit I mean people are very concerned you know about the economic impact of this uh, shutdown and the virus and I think you know Representative Crossman you're right too we need to think long term. It's sort of like, you know, what's the policy we need to do now uh, to help reduce the rate of infection and keep people healthy? But then what's the policy, you know, that we need to look at, you know, going forward uh, so that we can recover from this as quickly as possible from an economic standpoint? So I wondered, you know, if either of you are, are you hearing much from your constituents about this? You know, what are they asking about? You know, what are some of the things they're concerned about? You know, are there things that, you know, we in the health and human services area should be thinking about uh, in sort of responding to those questions or concerns? Um, so, I, you know, Representative Crossman, if you want to go first on this, and uh, and then Representative Upchurch, uh, go second. Thank you. Um, certainly people are worried about their livelihoods. I've heard from constituents that have lost their jobs already. I mean, uh, we can't go a day without hearing layoffs in certain sectors. I've heard from business owners that are concerned about having to lay people off and losing their businesses because they can't um, withstand, you know, a three- or four-month uh, downturn like this is being predicted. Um, I'm concerned about people's uh, access to health care. I'm concerned about people's access to mental health uh, services during this crisis. I mean, I think we're going to see, if this goes on long-term, uh, spikes in things like suicide and uh, other mental health issues. And so, um, you know, it doesn't take much speculation to understand that we are going to face some significant challenges the longer this goes on in all of those areas. Right. Thank you, Representative Carson. Representative Upchurch, uh, what are you hearing? Yeah. So the uh, a, a lot of the conversations I've been having uh, have been on two fronts. It has been uh, you know, livelihood, financial stability, 
as 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 well as healthcare. And, and the conversations I've been having with some of my business owners, uh, as the representative that uh, covers downtown Cleveland, there's you know hundreds and hundreds of jobs uh, just centered in that area. Um, some of the concerns I have is you know the the you know they're worried about laying people off. Uh, some folks have lost their jobs already, and and you know they want to know what the state is doing to. Uh, potentially stop the bleeding. Um, we may not heal the wound right away, but if we're able to stop the bleeding and, and find some sort of uh, financial relief for those that have lost their jobs, uh, as well as those businesses that have had to make those tough layoffs. And then on the uh, on the uh, healthcare front, uh, you know, the, the same concerns that, you know, Representative Crossman has been hearing, it's, it's been about access, especially uh, if, if this is going to be a long-term issue, um, making health care accessible, making quality care accessible, uh, especially uh, for low-income families, particularly in the Collinwood neighborhood and the Glenville neighborhood that I represent, uh, a lot of the calls that I've been getting out of those neighborhoods have been focused on access to health care and, and what they can do uh, to stay safe and to stay healthy during this time. So those have been a lot of the questions that I've been getting. Great, thank you, Representative. I, I think you know a couple of things I might mention. You know, to touch that sort of relate to these issues. You know, one is that uh, from a Medicaid standpoint, the state announced earlier this week, you know, that they will not be terminating anyone's Medicaid coverage who currently has it. You know, a lot of times people can get kind of tripped up when they've got redeterminations, when they've got to provide extra paperwork and things like that. But the state has said for the extent of this crisis that they won't be canceling anyone's Medicaid. So that's really, I think, good news and should give people some peace of mind. The other announcement yesterday was the state, you know, for the first time really dramatically expanded the use of telehealth. Uh, and so it allows providers to talk to patients by phone or by video or Skype or however they want to do it and still get paid for those services because that wasn't clear until now. And so that should help, you know, cover some of the routine things that people have. Maybe they need to get their prescriptions refilled or, or, or taken care of. They'll be able to do that through telehealth. And then the third area that we've been kind of focused on, too, is around nutrition assistance. You know, I know the Cleveland Food Bank yesterday held a food distribution uh, that it was their first time doing it, sort of a drive up where people would drive up and, and they put a box of emergency food in the person's trunk. And uh, they had people, The I think the distribution wasn't scheduled until start till four o'clock in the afternoon. And at 1030 in the morning, they already had people lining up. And I think by the end, they distributed well over a thousand of those boxes of food. So we know there's a lot of people out there that are in need of these things. And we appreciate what folks are doing. And on the the other side of that, too, is we're trying to sort of cut out some of the red tape in the SNAP program and the food stamp program so that folks, again, are able to maintain their benefits and uh, don't have to go through a lot of hoops to keep them. So I want to you know, look ahead a little bit uh, to next week, and you know, we appreciate you uh, going to Columbus and representing us there. It's really important. You know, I, I wonder, you know, I think, I, I'm sure, I'm not sure it was Representative Crossman or Representative Upchurch, you referenced there's been a lot of conversations you know, in your caucus about, you know, what we need to focus on next week and realizing that, you know, we may not have a lot of time, you know, for you to be there and to do so many important things. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you think either what's on maybe the Democratic caucus agenda for this next week and what are the things that you want to focus on this next week when you're in Columbus? Maybe uh, Representative Upchurch, if you want to go first this time. Sure. Uh, well, I, I can definitely tell you that we've been in constant communication. I know that the Democrats are putting together a a very uh, healthy package of, of different uh, different solutions that we feel that will help the state through this through this crisis, uh, and they're focused on uh, economic relief all the way to uh, expanding health care services, uh, expanding uh, access. Uh, some specifics are just uh, as, as far as economic relief. I'm personally looking at. Um, some sort of way to provide some temporary relief for uh, contract workers, freelancers, you know, the barbers, photographers, um, beauty salons, um, you know, folks whose whose pockets are going to be impacted right away. Um, and then on the healthcare front, again, uh, we talked about uh, telehealth earlier, um, which is great, and I think that's uh, something that will definitely help the state. However, uh, you know, a, a district like mine where I have some of the 
uh, wealthiest families in the state of Ohio. I also have some of the lowest income. Uh, I have a large amount of seniors who don't necessarily have an iPad, a smartphone, or a computer uh, that have the same questions and concerns as um, some of my other residents who do have access to telehealth. So it, 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 it's bridging that gap. Uh, is, is another thing that I'm looking at as well. So I'm happy to turn it over to Jeff. Representative Crespin, are you still there? Yep, I dropped off okay. by accidently. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, that, no talking problem. about priorities for next week. Yep. Uh, one yeah, pro- one priority... One priority that I have focused on in this General Assembly, which I think uh, is even more critical now than ever, is is uh, a bill that I jointly sponsored with my colleague, Re- uh, Representative Kleitz from Ravenna. Uh, that's House Bill 390. That's the pre-existing condition protection bill. Monday uh, is the 10th anniversary from, of the uh, passage of the uh, uh, of, uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, otherwise known as Obamacare. And uh, I think with people losing their jobs and, and, you know, getting back into the marketplace for insurance as they get back to work, they're going to be faced with uh, the prospect of, of losing health care coverage. I mean, we have this case pending in the U.S. Supreme Court now on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. And so I'm deeply concerned about people's access to uh, quality, affordable health care. So um, it becomes important even more now than ever to ensure that we keep pushing bills like that to ensure people have access to health care. Thank you, Representative Crossman. I think you make a good point. It's good to, I'm glad you reminded us that this next week is the 10th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. I was talking with a group yesterday, and I said, I, you know, I don't know where we'd be if we hadn't passed the ACA at this point, because through Medicaid and through uh, the health care exchanges and places like that, you know, we are set up now to provide health care to people, you know, when they lose coverage. And I think, you know, so we are very lucky to have passed that. And it's, uh, I think, a very important thing to remember. I also appreciate what uh, Representative Upchurch, you said about your sort of digital divide. I think you're right. We do have to, you know, remember our older adults uh, that are in our communities, that they are particularly vulnerable to this virus. I mean, we're all vulnerable, but they are particularly vulnerable. And anything we can do to support them and make sure they get the services they need, I think, is extremely important. So um, I guess I want to do maybe, and this may be tough to do right now since we're in the middle of this, um, but, you know, do a little uh, maybe crystal ball exercise. You know, typically at this time of year, um, state agencies would be working, starting that work within their agencies on their budget requests for next year. We'll have to pass a biennial budget next year, and uh, you know we're, we're obviously going to seems likely we'll be facing a situation where revenues will likely be down, and but our needs will be up, uh, you know, for uh, different services. And so I'm wondering, you know, if you thought about that at all, and you know, uh, you know what 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 do you should think should be on our priority list? You know, there's transportation, there's healthcare. You mentioned services for older adults, you know, economic development, you know, aid to businesses. Uh, I wonder if you might reflect a little bit or think a little bit about this question and, and what should be on our priorities. What are you thinking about? Um, or you can also say, oh, my God, I can't think about anything else <laughs> in the midst of all this. But uh, Representative uh, Crossman, do you want to try and tackle that first? Well, I think you, you laid out a lot of good priorities. Uh, we we, we want to continue to focus on transportation. Um, that, that's for sure. Representative Upchurch actually was, uh, uh, and he could talk more specifically about this, but uh, he was a real strong advocate for uh, increasing our access to public transportation um, and really fought for pu- public transportation dollars. And we need to make sure that that stays intact as, um, you know, uh, and, and maybe even increased and to ensure that we have a, a vital uh, uh, and robust public transportation system to make sure people can access their health care, make sure people can get to jobs and things like that. Um, so that's critically important, um, and you know I'm proud of the work we've done thus far. But we want to make sure we continue that. Um, again, healthcare access is going to be critically important moving forward. Again, we don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do with the Affordable Care Act, uh, whether they render it null and void um, uh, in its entirety or parse through some of the uh, components. But we do know that um, uh, components of the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, while the act itself has been politicized components of that act are very popular across the spectrum, whether it's Republican or Democrat or 
uh, rural or urban, people want access to quality, affordable health care. So, um, you know, the more we can do in that space, I think the better it, it benefits all of Ohio. And, you know, since we've been in the legislature, uh, Representative Upchurch uh, and the rest of our colleagues uh, have been talking about the Ohio promise. And, and what that means uh, uh, is that we, when we do our legislating, we do view it from a lens of what can we do to make Ohio a better place to live, work, and retire uh, right here in Ohio. And so all of our legislation that we've introduced has really tried to uh, focus through that lens, and um, we'll be continuing to focus um, on the Ohio Promise types of legislation as we move into the next GA. Representative Upchurch? Yeah. I uh, I want to go back to the uh, to the public transportation piece. That was obviously a big focus of mine uh, in this general assembly. Uh, I think Rep. Cross made a good point. It's not just a, it's not just a transportation issue. It's a health care issue. It's a jobs issue. It's an education issue. Uh, it's a child care issue. There are so many pieces of everyday life that are tied and wrapped around public transportation. Uh, and before this transportation budget, Ohio was ranked, I think, uh, 48th or 49th in the nation as far as state funding for public transportation. Uh, we were able to get the funding up to $70 million per fiscal year. Uh, that's $140 million that the state is going to be contributing to public transportation in a two-year period. Now, next General Assembly, um, if I'm fortunate to return, uh, it is my intention to uh, ask for increased funding. Uh, obviously, I, I would like to maintain it, maintain it at the funding levels that we're at, um, but I am certainly going to make a strong push to increase it because I think that we need to continue to increase it and continue to move the needle uh, in the right direction. Uh, and, and, you know, like Representative Crossan said, I mean, one of the things that I think that our leader has done a very good job in emphasizing is that when we legislate, we remember uh, that Ohio Promise model, uh, which is to make uh, everyday life better for everyday Ohioans, and that's certainly going to be a focus of mine, and I'm sure it's going to be a focus of, of, of the, the other members of my caucus, uh, making Ohio a better place to raise a family, work, and retire. I mean, that, that's going to be the centerpiece, uh, certainly for me, next General Assembly. Thank you, Representative Upchurch, and I, I want to uh, add to rep what Representative Crossman said, you know, really thank you for making transportation a priority. I know a lot of us who work uh, in this space, in the health and human services space, you know, we see every day how important transportation, how the act, how important access to transportation is to the people that we serve. So we really appreciate your leadership on this. And uh, and uh, also, you know, I also want to call out, as you mentioned, you know, your House Minority Leader, Representative Amelia Sykes. Uh, she's been extremely accessible to us and, and really sort of on point, particularly around some of these health and human service issues. So we appreciate that as well. So um, I'm going to take this maybe a little off topic, but I, you know, I just wonder, you know, I know uh, coronavirus is sort of front and center for all of us, but I know there's some other big issues that the legislature, you know, still has to tackle that are important. You know, one is around this whole ed choice issue and the other is around the election. You know, what, and I just wonder if you have any insight into what you think might happen with either those issues and whether those might get addressed this next week uh, in Columbus. And uh, Representative Upchurch, if you want to go first this time. Sure, sure. Well, you know, honestly, I haven't heard much about uh, the, the ed choice uh, so I'm not sure if that's going to be a centerpiece uh, next week when we return. Uh, I think the, 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 the focus will be um, stopping the bleeding and the economic impact of this coronavirus, as well as keeping our state healthy and safe. Uh, so I, I haven't heard much discussion about that. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there have been some discussions about how we're going to handle the election. I don't necessarily know if that's going to be part of uh, what we're going to be working on next week when we return, um, but I think we'll be addressing the election probably sooner than we would Ed Choice. Uh, this this virus has definitely sucked all the oxygen out of the room and it's definitely um, shifted the, the the focus and uh, what we what we were working on prior to uh, the recess that we took. So I I, I do believe that uh, as far as priorities, I think we will address the election sooner than we would. Ed Choice. I think Ed Choice may be on a temporary hold for the moment, and I'll turn it over to my colleague. 
Uh, thank you, Rip Up Church. Uh, I could tell you that the election is paramount uh, because of the way it, um, it was postponed. Um, there's some ongoing litigation relative to the election. It's our hope that we can uh, forego litigation, um, uh, the need for litigation rather, uh, and simply re reset the date for the primary. And I've spoken with the uh, Cuyahoga County Board of uh, Elections on uh, what they would prefer to see. Um, I've talked to, we, we, we had a conversation yesterday with all of our colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle uh, on a bill that we're going to be proposing next week uh, to address the election, which would be to forego in-person voting uh, for this primary election uh, and choose a date that's much earlier than this June 2nd because we have to put this election to bed. We have to resolve it. And there's people, quite frankly, I didn't get a chance to vote. I, was, uh, I, I like to vote in person. I was waiting to vote in person. I was ready to vote on Tuesday. Um, Me too. I still want the opportunity to exercise my right to vote. So I'm sure there's others in my vote as well. Um, but I do, um, uh, one point I do want to make about Ed Choice that you raised, um, Representative Patterson, uh, Democrat from Ashtabula County, uh, he has a bill uh, that will be introduced soon that will um, uh, cancel the state testing for this year. Um, and uh, that's a request that uh, Representative Sebecki and I made to the governor by letter last week to simply come out now and state that the state mandated testing is postponed this year, canceled this year, so that the students and teachers can focus on matriculating students to the next level rather than focused on state testing. Uh, Rep. Patterson is going to be introducing legislation on those lines, and I believe included in there is some language dealing with that choice which would freeze um, the uh, voucher program at the level it was at the last academic year. So there would be no expansion. So um, that's, I believe, his suggestion on how we should address Ed Choice. Whether the House or Senate decide to pick that up and run with it next week is, is anybody's guess, uh, except for maybe the speakers. Um, but we have not spoken with him on that particular issue. Uh, so that's what I know on, on both of those fronts. Thank you, Representative Crossman. I appreciate it. So I'm going to tell you what my final question is going to be, and then I'm going to make a couple of announcements. I'll give you a chance to think about it. So I think, and I also want to say about the election, you know, one of the things in the human service world that we're focused on is the health and human services levy, issue 33, and obviously, you know, keeping a strong health and human services system in place while we're sort of battling this epidemic is very important to all of us. But um, so the last question I'm going to ask you is to, if both of you could think about something that you've seen over the last several days, something positive that's kind of giving you hope because I think people are sort of interested in that. We're sort of, you know, seeing a lot of bad news. And so I wonder if you could think about that. But in the, before you answer that, I just want to remind our participants that if you'd like to ask a question of either of the legislators present, just type the question in the chat box and we'll, uh, uh, Danny Carlson will be sort of presiding over that and asking those questions from you. Uh, so feel free to do that. You can do that now. And uh, anyways, um, uh, Representative Upchurch, have you seen something this week, something positive that's kind of giving you hope uh, for the future? Oh, definitely. I mean, I've, I've seen uh, communities come together, and I've seen random acts of kindness that have uh, definitely given me hope that we're going to get through this. Uh, it's going to take some time, of course, and um, it's going to be tough. But, you know, I have more confidence now than I've ever had that uh, the goodwill of people, especially here in Ohio, uh, will prevail. Um, just this morning, I got a call from a restaurant owner uh, in my district uh, saying that they prepared 50 meals and they're going to drop them off to uh, the homeless shelter. Um, and mind you, with business taking an impact that it is, to still be able to give 50 free meals uh, is, is, is definitely a, a good sign. And it, and it shows that, uh, you know, the goodwill of people always prevails. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic. Representative Kaufman? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, as we started off, um, the numbers of cases in Ohio have not been increasing dramatically relative to what other states are seeing. So that alone should be positive news, that, that it, people are uh, following the guidance that Dr. Acton from the Department of Health and Governor DeWine have outlined. People have been abiding by that. Um, and it seems to be working, and we'll see as as the, as the days and, and hopefully the weeks progress, we can we can start to see our way out of this. Uh, to Rep Representative Upchurch's point, 
uh, I have seen people coming together both online. Um, we're all um, concerned about our fellow neighbors and family members. And uh, I've seen um, things like at the grocery store. There was a gentleman who was about to buy the last two rolls of toilet paper as this other woman was approaching. And uh, uh, she um, said, oh, uh, uh, I missed out, and he handed her one. You know what I mean? So uh, we have to think about our neighbors and, and our friends and our community and I see people, I see the evidence of people doing that. So um, it, it's, it's heartwarming to see when, when we demonstrate that caring and, and comfort to other people. That's great. That's great. And, and toilet paper has become the new currency, I guess, these days. Apparently. That's right. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, first, if you'd like to ask a question of either legislators, uh, please type the question in the chat box. And uh, Dan will uh, help us uh, moderate those questions. So, Danny, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, and we have quite a few questions. You can still keep se sending them in and we'll try to answer as many as we can with the uh, representatives. So uh, some of these you guys have already touched on, but just uh, if you could focus a little bit more, we had some questions about the digital divide. Um, people saying their spouses are seeing problems with school system students remotely having a difficult time uh, dialing in. We've had a couple of questions about this. And I'm wondering if, you both could address that digital divide issue a little bit more. I can jump in a little bit. I, I've talked to a couple school board members, um, not just in Parma, but across the state. And, um, you know, there's communities out there that don't have technology to uh, allow students to learn from home or in the home themselves, they may not have the access to the internet uh, that's ne necessary so that people can learn, learn from home. So that is a significant challenge and one that I think uh, moving forward in terms of talking about priorities for our budget next year that we're going to have to look at uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how can we get uh, everybody on the same level playing field? It goes to education funding and uh, resource allocation and, and issues like that. But, you know, these are real significant questions that this uh, crisis has certainly uh, highlighted for us. Yeah, and, and I want to just touch on that too i think that this crisis has um and how do i want to word this i think this crisis has brought light to a lot of issues that have uh been out there for some time that uh may have not been a primary focus and prior to this crisis you know families in my district lower income families um that don't have internet access that don't have uh service would go to a library for their service well obviously now that certainly you know they're, they're not able to do that because of what's going on. Uh, so I want to make it a priority that when this crisis is over, they don't have to go back to what they were doing before. It, this, this crisis brings light to an issue that uh, we need to make sure that, you know, low-income families do have access to Internet. They do have uh, quality service, uh, and that should be a priority. My, my colleague is absolutely right. That should be a priority. Uh, in, in the next budget cycle. And it certainly will be a priority for me, and I'm optimistic it will be a priority for a lot of my colleagues, at least within the Democratic caucus. Great, thank you. Um, we had a couple of questions, uh, not surprisingly, on unemployment compensation. So let me start out first. Uh, do either of you know, and we'll start with uh, Representative Upchurch this time, has there been any discussion about lowering the threshold to qualify for unemployment compensation so that minimum wage workers are eligible? Uh, absolutely. That has uh, certainly been a, uh, a topic of discussion throughout our conversations we've had within the caucus. Uh, and, and not just uh, lowering the qualifications, but expanding. Uh, as of right now, there are certain uh, jobs that don't qualify for it. Uh, and at least during a state of emergency or a crisis, they should be able to uh, qualify for, for some of those benefits. So those, that's definitely been a, a focus and part of the discussions we've been having in caucus, without a doubt. And Representative yeah. Crossman, anything to add? Yeah, thank you. To Representative Upchurch's point, yeah, we should be making it more, uh, making it clearer that people in this emergency situation for sure should have access to the same benefits that other people are going to have. Those are the folks that are most likely to be impacted by all of this, um, uh, for starters. Um, you know, and, and this, I think, has laid bare, this crisis has laid bare the uh, failure 
uh, by the legislature and prior general assemblies, and even ours up to this point, to address the shortfalls in the unemployment compensation system uh, that people have been screaming about since uh, for the last several years. I mean, we've been in a uh, we had the good fortune of a good economy for the last several years, but the state legislature uh, has failed to um, uh, shore up the unemployment compensation system. So I think what we're going to be seeing is either a, a depletion of our rainy day funds or we're going to see uh, borrowing from the federal government to shore up our unemployment compensation system. But this uh, this is a real critical issue as we move forward. Uh, we need to be, during the good times, planning for situations like this, and I think this is a stark reminder of the necessity to do that. Great. Um, and another uh, unemployment question, again, some of these I know we've touched on a little bit in the discussion, but um, there are employees that are self-contractors in the entertainment service industry, those working in the gig economy. Um, are they covered by unemployment currently? Uh, and if not, are there supports in place for them now and for those who are chronically unemployed? Well, unfortunately, people that are self-proprietors or self -con or, uh, independent contractors are not likely covered by unemployment compensation. Um, and that's a shortfall that, you know, we can certainly address at the legislature. It's a policy mm -hmm. question, if, how far we want to extend those benefits and whether we have the resources to do that. Uh, we are going to offer others on the, on the flip side uh, for businesses. Probably it's going to be in the form of loans, low interest loans, uh, through SBA, which uh, was approved yesterday. Um, some, some funding availability for those folks to get them through some of these difficult times. But, um, you know, <laughs> you're asking some tough, tough policy questions here and things that we're going to have to really take a strong look at uh, to, to decide where, where we can and, uh, reasonably uh, provide assistance in, in this time. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, you know, my, my colleagues, right, I, I don't think that those jobs are uh, unfortunately covered, uh, but I know that the focus has been, at least in the time of crisis uh, or state of emergency, however you want to uh, phrase it, uh, those benefits should be available and should be accessible. And one more on uh, unemployment. Um, do you do either of you know if anyone is thinking about either requiring employers to continue paying for their temporarily laid off employees' health coverage, or providing a fund to keep people's insurance going through uh, April 1st? And we'll start with you, Representative Upchurch, this time. Uh, I know that that's been part of the conversations that we've been having. Uh, obviously, we've been having a lot of conversations. Uh, but again, I'm not sure if the caucus has taken a position on what we think um, is best for employers at the time. I mean, each, each of our districts are different, uh, and the dynamics of businesses uh, in our districts are different. Um, so I, I, I'm personally open to continuing to have those conversations. Obviously, I understand the, the, um, the need for a sense of urgency on how we act. Uh, but at the end of the day, I would like to do what, what works best for uh, what works best for families, uh, and and what also works best for businesses too. Because I don't want to see businesses shutting their doors, uh, which will ultimately lead to uh, longer uh, unemployment spurts. Uh, so as far and, and Jeff, you can feel free to piggyback on this. As, as I, I think that's been the gist of the discussion. I don't think we've actually taken a position yet. No, there's been no formal position. So just to let everybody know, uh, in, in the last, uh, you know, since this crisis started, um, Leaders Clinics had us all sort of divided up into work groups uh, to try and uh, create legislation or propose legislation that we should be prioritizing as we move forward in the General Assembly here. Um, and so, you know, there was a health working group and they made some recommendations and um, I don't recall if this is one among those recommendations, but it's certainly something to um, uh, to, to discuss and to address. Um, you know, I don't know if we can force employers to continue paying health insurance, but it's something we can certainly take a look at. Great. Um, and kind of a follow-up to uh, to those questions: What conversations are the both of you having with your Republican counterparts about the crisis, and 
Is there any sense some of the ideas you are further exploring, some of which you've talked about today, are also ideas that they might support? And Representative Crossman, we'll start with you this time. Quite frankly, we, I've had very minimal contact with my Republican colleagues. Um, you know, I think they're, they're working on their side as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had a minimal conversation with the speaker rel relative to school testing. Um, and what we're going to do there, he's supportive of our effort to try and um, forego school testing at this point. But, you know, I'm eager to get back to Columbus next week to have uh, some more robust discussion around some of these priorities uh, that we're, that we're uh, pushing here next week. Yeah, and I haven't uh, quite frankly had any uh, conversations with uh, my colleagues on the other side either. Uh, the majority of the conversations I've been having have been with my uh, Democratic colleagues. I'm, I'm sure they're on their side working on uh, what they think is, is, is best for Ohio during the duration of this crisis. Uh, I'm also eager, eager to get back and, and begin to put our ideas together and see where we can find those, the middle and find some common ground to get some stuff done. We have another tough policy question for you guys. Uh, John Corlett, our executive director yesterday, was on IdeaStream uh, suggesting possibly creating a new cash assistance group during this crisis using the state's considerable TANF surplus. Um, do either of you have any thoughts on doing that? And Representative Upchurch, we'll start with you this time. Well, I'm, I'm certainly open to it. I mean, we've, we've got uh, pots of money that I think we can tap into that will certainly, you know, get, get us through this or at least help get us through this. I mean, you know, my, my colleague brought up the rainy day fund. I mean, there's a, a little over $2 billion in it, I think. And, you know, I don't know the, the exact number, forgive me. Um, but I'm certainly open to that. And I, I think we need to look at um, different alternatives, especially with, us not knowing how long this crisis is going to be and what the long-term impacts are going to be, we definitely need to be open to looking at all all kinds of different methods to uh, assist families and to uh, pull Ohio through this. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in there as well. I mean, um, there's been a lot of calls for uh, drawing down the uh, rainy day fund. I, I believe it's closer to $3 billion that we're sitting on there. And um, so we have to be smart in how we deploy those resources uh, to uh, ensure that we, you know, when we do come out of this, we restart our economic activity in a way that creates jobs and, and ensures people are employed and, and working and our economy is, is working the way it was working. Um, that said, you know, cash assistance, I'm not sure if that's the most effective use of our resources. Um, certainly worth a discussion. I know the federal government is proposing something similar. I don't know that it makes sense giving every single American $1,200. I mean, there's people that, you know, I mean, um, quite frankly, don't necessarily need $1,200 and it really isn't the best use of that resource. Um, I think, you know, focusing on tax policy and whether it made sense to give out, you know, uh, billions of uh, dollars of tax relief to corporations in 2017, if that's, if that's something that we should be focused on instead in terms of what of our state and federal tax policy relative to, um, you know, how that's impacting, you know, ordinary Americans. Um, so cash assistance is something that is easy to do, but I don't know how much uh, in the long term it's really effective. It's a nice sort of a short-term fix, but I don't know that it goes the length it needs to go to make sure that our economy is working for everybody. Great. Um, one more question uh, for, the, for the two of you. Uh, what safeguards are the legislators taking when you return to Columbus to discuss these important issues? And Representative Crossman, let's start with you this time. Good question. I have no clue uh, to answer your question. Uh, uh, it's a fantastic question. You know, um, quite frankly, I thought we should have been in the legislature this week uh, when, when the uh, crisis over the election occurred on Monday. We should have been in Columbus resolving this. Uh, and there's ways we could have handled it. We could have gone in groups of 10 to vote. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things we can do. Uh, we have all kinds of technology. We're doing this thing by telephone conference. I mean, there's all types of things that we can in, uh, uh, do to ensure safety and to make sure that we're still getting the business done for the state of Ohio. And I know there's a bill out there that our caucus is going to be proposing to allow city councils and school boards to meet virtually 
um, to satisfy Ohio Sunshine laws and do all the things that we need to do to make these meetings public. Uh, but we can do this, and you know uh, we need to do this. And you know our our medical professionals are working on a daily basis. Our police and fire and other first responders are working on a daily basis, and they're getting the job done. And we need to as well. There's critical government functions that need to be accomplished, and uh, you know we can work out these details. But to answer your questions on the de on the details of what they are, I, I have not been made aware of those. I, uh, Church, I don't believe uh, those have been shared with us yet. No, I, I haven't been made aware of those either. I, 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 you know, to my understanding, you, it's advised that you don't have more than 50 individuals in a room at one time. Uh, obviously, just members alone, there's 99 of us plus, you know, staff uh, and media. We're we're talking well over 100 people. So I don't know what the uh, steps are. Uh, I'll leave that to the discretion of the speaker, but there, you know, like my colleague said, there are certainly alternative ways that uh, we could use to, to address some of these issues. And he's, you know, he's absolutely right. I, I think we should have been, we should have been in session last week um, handling some of these issues, especially with, with respect to the election. Uh, you know, it's a good question, but, you know, as far as specifics, I am, I am not sure. Okay. Um, we had a couple more questions just come in now uh, to the both of you. Have you been discussing the issue of providing funds for rental assistance? Once the crisis ends, those who have lost their jobs will still owe rent, even though eviction is prevented right now. And Representative Upchurch, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, so that's been uh, that's been part of the conversation in some of the working groups. Uh, as, as, as far as rental assistance, you know, cause I, I know that uh, once we get through this, um, some folks will have um, very large, you know, amounts of rent due at all at one time, possibly. Uh, so some sort of temporary assistance is part of the discussion. Again, I'm not sure uh, what we're going to be looking at as far as where the funding will come from or how it looks, uh, but we certainly are, are aware that uh, renters are going to need help through the process. I'm sorry, through this crisis and, and, and after. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there as well. Um, I actually have a call uh, after this, uh, uh, after this program, I have a call later this afternoon with, uh, or later this morning with uh, Legal Aid uh, to talk about this very issue. And uh, one of the things that we will be proposing, I, I know it's great to see the courts have uh, voluntarily suspended evictions, um, but um, I think what we need to do and, and uh, Le Rep. Dave Leland from Columbus and I have discussed is a postponement, not just on foreclosures and evictions, but uh, for a period of time after this crisis ends, meaning once the state of emergency is withdrawn, uh, and that, that parties actually, before they file evictions, are able to move forward with evicting anybody or foreclosing and, and kicking people out of their homes, that they go through a mandatory mediation process to help landlords and tenants and bankers and borrowers uh, give them the opportunities to try and discuss uh, sort of win-win where we can keep people in their homes uh, and make everybody whole uh, to the extent that we can. So um, so th these are the things that I'm thinking of on, on the, along those lines. Again, um, uh, rental assistance is great if we have the resources to do it, but um, we're trying to think big picture as well. And another question came in, uh, wondering if the legislature is starting to think about how to form task forces, anything like that, to address all of the aspects of the post-pandemic recovery. And Representative Crossman, we'll start with you this time. Well, I'm not sure what specific task force they're referring to, but clearly, uh, and, and first and foremost, I want to say, thank God we have assets like the Cleveland Clinic, UH, and Metro. Um, you know, that have really, uh, you know, there are communities that just don't have those types of resources, and thank goodness we have those here locally. Uh, but clearly, uh, we can't rely on the federal government to, um, you know, uh, be prepared to address things like this. And we have to uh, perhaps create our own pandemic task force to uh, plan uh, that we have enough hospital beds for people that when uh, something like this happens, uh, that we have sufficient space to, to treat people, um, that, you know, we have, um, uh, we move a lot quicker on, uh, you know, maybe we do this task force takes a look at 
how we can move quicker in getting testing kits available. I mean, uh, that's one of the biggest flaws and, and real problems of this crisis is we just didn't have sufficient testing early enough. Um, maybe there's this task force that we put together can, can make recommendations to the federal government on things that the state needs to uh, be able to handle these crises uh, when they do arrive on our own. Because, like I said, we can't rely on the federal government clearly to to uh, address uh, things as swiftly as we need them to. So I think uh, going forward, we need to be prepared to be self-sufficient if the need comes. Yeah, and, and, and I'll jump in there, too. I mean, my, my colleague is absolutely right. And um, with, without getting um, – without letting my political persuasion get in the way here, I'm just going to, you know, uh, champion what he said earlier. We cannot rely on the federal government in, 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 these, in times like this. Uh, as far as uh, task forces um, go, I mean, I, I don't think we've had any conversations, at least within the working group that I'm a part of, um, but that's a good idea, and that's something that I'm willing to definitely take back uh, as we continue these conversations, because I do think that uh, a task force to make recommendations to the federal government would, would certainly be beneficial. Great. Um, another question coming in. One of the primary resources used by older adults in our communities is senior transportation connection. How can social service providers who have been particularly hard hit by COVID-19 uh, like this organization be protected to ensure that they are here to provide services once business returns to normal. And Representative Upchurch, I think it's your turn to start. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's a real good question. Uh, and again, I think that's just a, a, another good idea. There's, there's, there's so many good ideas that have been thrown out today. I think that's just another good idea that uh, I can definitely take back. But uh, it's important for the legislature to, to be mindful of organizations like yours that are here for a certain purpose. Um, we certainly want to keep you guys around uh, after the crisis, uh, you know, because you, you are really an asset uh, and a resource for us as we, you know, do our jobs. Um, as far as specifics, uh, you know, I have to really actually – sit down and, and, and give that some deep thought, and I actually haven't even had an opportunity. But, I mean, it's certainly something that um, I'll definitely be taking back to, to my working group, and I'll be taking back to the caucus if we have conversations. I don't think I can add anything better than that. Great. Uh, we just got another question in. Uh, how will Ohio legislators address the rise of racism and xenophobia towards Asian people due to the coronavirus? Uh, Representative Crossman, we'll start with you this time. Well, yes, and this came up actually. Uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the reporters asked this very question uh, of the governor last Wednesday during his press conference, or maybe last Tuesday. Um, and I thought the governor handled it perfectly, which is, you know, now is not the time. I mean, the governor said this. Now is not, the t you know, not that there's ever a time, but, you know, we can't start tearing at each other. And uh, this is a uh, global crisis uh, that we're dealing with in our own backyard. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, Ohioans need to come together to resolve the situation, not tear each other apart by focusing on, on uh, differences among us. This is, we're going to... We're going to combat this crisis together, and uh, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm alarmed by the the racism uh, uh, demonstrated by certain leaders in our country. Um, you know, calling this uh, you know a China crisis or focusing on Asian Americans or anything like that. Um, this is a, a human crisis, and that's what we need to focus on: that that our commonalities and and how what we can do to to fight this together. Yeah, and, and I'll jump in. I think it's 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 unfortunate. It's quite sad that some of our leaders are taking uh, a crisis like this, where people have lost their lives, families have lost their livelihood, and taking it as an opportunity to be divisive and to tear us apart. I think that uh, at least in in our roles as as leaders and and members of the legislature, we have to set an example uh, and 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 be more mindful uh, of of what we say and what we do and make sure that we walk in purpose, and that's to bring people together and not be divisive. 
Great. Thank you both so much for your time this morning. We're coming up on the 1030. So thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. I'm going to uh, stop them now, though, and turn things back over to our Executive Director, John Corlett. John? Thanks, Danny, and thank you, uh, Representative Crossman and Representative Upchurch, for joining with us this morning. I think it was really valuable, and you can hear by the breadth of the questions that people ask that uh, people have a lot of concerns. And I want to sort of echo the last uh, response to, on the last question. I think we can all take a stand against racism. You know, that's important in this community to not let people divide us and to stand up uh, and, 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 and make ourselves active against that. So I think that's important. I want to thank our audience for joining us this morning. We'll probably do more of these uh, in the future uh, to get uh, things out. And I guess the one thing I want to finish with is, you know, I think one of the things we learned, um, you know, from the Great Recession was that, uh, and this sort of relates to the federal government and the questions uh, about that, that I think one of the mistakes we realized that we made afterwards was that we went too small in our response, that we could have gotten out of the recession sooner if we'd gone bigger in our response. And so I think, you know, for all of us, you know, involved in policy, involved with, you know, federal and state policy, I think it's important that we go big uh, and because this is a big challenge that we face and that nothing should be off the table. Uh, we should consider everything as options and, and work them through. So uh, will Center for Community Solutions, or will we continue, obviously, to follow these issues? We'll post things on our website and on Twitter and other social media. So stay with us. Um, we hope everybody has a little chance to maybe just relax a little bit this weekend. And uh, and right now, at least where I'm sitting in Lakewood, Ohio, the sun is out. So uh, I'm going to end on that sunny note and uh, turn it back over to Danny, and we'll wrap things up. Thank you. Great. Thank you again, everyone, for attending our forum, and especially thank you to uh, Representatives Crossman and Upchurch. Usually this is when people would be uh, applauding for you. So thank you again for taking the time today and for answering uh, all of these questions. Uh, and just to everyone who attended, we have been recording this webinar, and the video will be available uh, later today on our website and I will I've shared that link in the attendee chat box but I will also share it again um, and thank you all again so much for taking the time and please uh, stay safe and we'll stay together during this thank you all again